Welcome to our second lesson in our Chapter 4, Energy from Combustion. We last left looking at some efficiency calculations, and I wanted to pick up with one more example before we dive into the chemistry of coal. So the power plant efficiency formula, that's a mouthful, we know that no electric plant can be completely efficient, 100% efficient, and therefore we're just asked to consider what type of um, electrical net energy are we producing from the amount of coal that's being placed into the power plant. So remember our formula? Electrical energy produced divided by the available heat from the fuel represented as a percentage to find our net efficiency. The higher that temperature of the steam, the more efficient the power plant. And we had mentioned that some of our modern day power plants run as well as 90% efficient. Some of the older models are anywhere from 35 to 40% efficient. Let's take a quick look at a sapling question, one of your homework questions, to illustrate this concept. We're being asked to calculate the percent efficiency of a coal burning power plant that produces 79,600,000 kilojoules of energy to heat a home and the home only requires 29,400 kJs of heat. So you can see what we need to produce the 29,400 and then three more zeros. This is the amount of heat needed to heat a home, let's say annually. But in order to provide this, we actually have to burn or produce from coal 79,600,000 kilojoules of heat. See this ratio is what the home needs, this value, but this is what we have to burn in order to provide that because we just don't have that 100% efficient Let's calculate that, shall we? I'll grab my calculator. Please do the same. Make sure we get a common answer. And so, 29,400, three zeros, divided by 79,600, three more zeros, and multiplied by 100 to express as a percent. It looks like our power plant, our coal burning power plant, I'm finding about 36.93% efficient, which is about what we're finding for our older models, isn't it? Just one more practice before we start into our next lesson, the topic of coal. So we understand that, you know, for about two centuries ago, this industrial revolution began, and it's a great exploitation of fossil fuels that still continues to this day. We burn fossil fuels, and in essence, coal, as a source of energy. Coal continues to provide more than 50% of our nation's energy until about 1940 and we start to see um, you know, an overtake from petroleum. Coal is a complex mixture of substances. However, in essence, coal is about 85% by mass carbon. So you can see a, you know, a chemical formula for coal, C subscript 135, H96, O9, nitrogen sulfur. 85% by mass of this compound we know as coal is just plain old carbon with some trace elements. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur were all part of the original ancient plant material as it fossilized over the course of millions of millions of years. Remember, coal is considered to be a non-renewable resource just simply because it takes so long to regenerate from the uh, organic matter of plant material. So in essence, coal is carbon with other trace elements coming from the original plant life as it fossilized through millions of years. We can see from this particular graph, and again, top of page 163, about 1840, the majority, it looks like all of our um, energy from burning was coming from burning wood. About 1850, do you see here how we started to burn coal? And coal overtook wood, notice here, in about 1885, if you will, and started to rise in the early 1900s. You can see right in this general area, wood 
has pretty much remained constant. People heat with wood for convenience, but these coal-burning power plants were being produced, and, and coal was the, the number one way that we heated our country. And then time went by, and look at the pretty average here. We saw a little plummet, but over an average here, we see amount of coal has remained steady, and a little bit of increase here in, in, in late history here. It's about 2000. But definitely you see this blue, the petroleum is starting to take over. And so again, you know, the maximum we've reached here is in between 1970 to the 2000 era. Petroleum is by far the most abundant resource we use to combust and release energy. Natural gas is also on the rise. Natural gas is a component of petroleum. It's the lightest uh, gas, CH4 is its formula. So just the simplest hydrocarbon, but we are burning natural gas. And again, coal is pretty much on the, on the steady here with the natural gas consumption. So we're starting to see coal um, you know, decline as petroleum increases, but we also have to consider, you know, we started with saying um, we don't live on the earth, we borrow it from our we uh, borrow it from our future generations that um, you know, saying where we said we didn't inherit this land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Thinking about what are these other non renewable resources that we need to start considering implementing things like renewable sources, solar, wind, all of these hydroelectric power plants. You can see overall they're hardly contributing, but wouldn't it be nice to start to see them rise in their contributions? So our coal. Coal is of course a, a combustion reaction where we're looking at the components of coal and just calculating the mass of carbon. I had said it's about 85 percent by mass, but let's kind of show you where this number is coming from. So we're going to assume the composition of coal to be C135. It has H96. and oxygen, we have nine of those. We have one nitrogen and we have one sulfur in that formula. We want to know the mass of carbon in tons if we started with 1.5 million tons of coal. So 1.5 million is 1.5 times 10 to the sixth tons of coal. Out of that, how many are coming just from carbon? And so this kind of brings us back to um, our last chapter when we talked about percent composition by mass. I want to know just the tons of coal, of, uh, of just carbon, compared to the ton of coal. So it's really just a mass percentage. So I know from the periodic table, carbon has an atomic weight of 12, right off the periodic table. Do you see that? But in this formula, there's 135 atoms of carbon. So molar mass of carbon times the number of atoms we have, I'm going to take 12 times 135, and when I do that, I get 1620 grams. All right, just a number here from the molar mass. All righty, 1620. Hydrogen has a molar mass of 1. Do you see that on your periodic table? It has an atomic weight of 1. But there's 96 of them in our formula, so we're going to know to take 96 total grams. Oxygen on our periodic table has an atomic weight, we'll say 16, but do you see how there's 9 of them in this formula? Nine of those at 16 apiece gives me a total weight of 144 grams. Nitrogen, find it on your periodic table, you'll see its atomic weight is 14. And when you find sulfur on the periodic table, it has an atomic weight of 32. Let's sum each one of the components. I want you to add 1620, the contribution of coal from carbon, plus 96, the contribution of coal from hydrogen, plus 144, that's the contribution of oxygen and coal, plus 14 from the nitrogen, and 32 from the sulfur.
When you add all of those together, we get a grand total of 1906 grams in every mole. So the sum, all of the atoms added together, gives me 1906. Now remember, the carbon contributed 1620 of that total contribution. See what we've done? This little part here is what we called a conversion factor. It's percent by mass of carbon. That's a topic we covered together last chapter. Just part over whole to express a percent. So that's the mass percent of carbon, part over whole. Notice what's happened. We can calculate by canceling our coal variable and end with the carbon. So let's hit that on our calculator. You would hit 1.5. Use your scientific notation key for the times 10 value. We want that to be 1.5 million, so we need six zeros after that. And then we want to multiply that by the ratio of 1620 divided by 1906. That's your key sequence on your calculator. Our original sample of coal times the percent by mass of carbon, and we've converted into the grams or tons, because we use tons here as our initial thing, so that would be fine. We end up with a ratio here of 1.3, and that's a million, so times 10 to the sixth tons of carbon. 1.3 million, or 1.3 times 10 to the sixth tons of carbon. Process with me what we just did. We had sitting at the coal, the power plant, one and a half million tons of coal. In that one and a half million, the vast majority, 1.3 million, are coming just from the elemental form of carbon. It gives us insight into saying coal, by the vast majority of its composition, is indeed carbon, with these few other trace elements depending upon the purity of carbon. So petroleum and natural gas started to overtake coal around the 1950, and we saw that in that previous graph. We know that petroleum is a mixture of several thousand different compounds, and the great majority of these compounds are hydrocarbons. So as we begin to explore petroleum, and this is now what we would consider section 4.4, we start to consider the elements or the, or the molecules found in petroleum, specifically also natural gas. Let's take a quick peek at a very important diagram. Uh, this is found on page 167. We're going to be asked to look at the names, the formulas, the structural formulas, and the condensed structural formulas for the first 10 hydrocarbons. So the first hydrocarbon is the simplest of all. It has just one carbon surrounded by four hydrogens. Its Lewis dot structure would have a tetrahedral shape, if we remember from our molecular geometry, where we'd have one central carbon and four hydrogens surrounding it. We would have a nonpolar molecule with polar bonds. So when we begin to consider CH4, its structural formula, we need to associate that with the word methane, the easiest hydrocarbon of all. We often hear that called natural gas. We burn that in our homes most often as our source of heat in our kitchen as well as in our furnace. Now notice this, that the uh, boiling point, and we'll just kind of keep tab as we start looking at this, the lightest of all 
This is definitely a gas at room temperature. Negative 164 degrees Celsius is its boiling point. So it's very low boiling point. Very easy to convince to turn that into a gas. Well, let's take a look at our next hydrocarbon. Here we had just one. What if we had two hydrocarbons connected together? Our carbon backbone is C connected to another C. And we finish those four bonds. We know that carbon has to have four bonds in order to satisfy the octet rule. And so the six remaining hydrogen just create this perfectly symmetrical molecule where each one of these carbon, one attached to each other, and then the three hydrogens surround it. This is a molecule we call ethane, E-T-H-A-N-E, -E, ethane. Our first one was methane. Here is ethane. Notice that its boiling point is a little bit a little bit higher, negative 89. Notice the increased molar mass, the more atoms we have. It takes a little more energy to get that molecule to boil, the heavier the molecule becomes. So the lightest molecule, of course, takes the least amount of energy to boil. And as the carbon chains begin to grow, we'll see the amount of energy needed to boil also increases. Now here's our little trick. I would one carbon, two carbons, three carbons. To find the number of hydrogens, I'm going to double the carbon subscript and add two. Doubling it makes it six plus two more gives me eight. Let me re share with you why I have to add the two at the end. So there's my three carbons in a row. That's three carbons. That's not an E. And the two that I add on for each fill that octet. So that's where I doubled. And why add two? Well, I have to have two for the terminal carbons, don't I? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are the eight hydrogens. I'm going to be just a little lazy and leave them like this. You may as well. We've just built the molecule known as propane. Propane you might have on your gas grill out in your backyard. You'll often see signs for LPG. Liquid propane gas is what those signs are saying. If you stop and fill your propane tank, you have an LPG service station. What's happened to the boiling point? Well, it's getting a little bit closer to zero, isn't it? It doesn't you know, it, it's approaching a higher and higher value, it's taking more and more energy as the molecules begin to grow. C4H, how many? Double the carbon, that's eight. Add two for the ends, and we have ten, don't we? The carbon backbone would have four carbons in a row. Two hydrogens on each of those. And then to complete the octet of the end carbons, there's the plus two. That gives us ten total hydrogens in this molecule known as butane. Now maybe you know butane by its common name called lighter fluid. Typically in a disposable lighter, you'll see a liquid fuel in there. It's known as butane. Now notice butane is actually a liquid at room temperature. So far, Methane, ethane, and propane have been gases at room temperature. This has a boiling point of about zero. It's about 0.5 degrees Celsius. Now we get to pentane, C5. How many H's? Double the 10, add 2, and we get 12. So again, we'll have our five carbons in a row. We add two H's to complete these. So even though I'm just drawing the lines, you understand they're representing hydrogens at each terminal point. And then, of course, the two at the end to complete the octet. We just drew a molecule called pentane. And pentane has a boiling point of 36 degrees Celsius. Now let's emphasize. 
as the molecule becomes heavier and heavier we're adding more and more carbons and hydrogens making the molecules molar mass heavier it takes more energy to get that heavier molecule to boil we see a definite increase in the boiling point as the carbon chain begins to lengthen and I'm emphasizing this because it will be very critical when we look at the petroleum distillation uh, you know and how we separate out these molecules based on their weights we'll keep going here C6H14 a molecule known as hexane you can see that you would have six carbons in a row for the prefix hex one two three four five six and again you'll add on your structural hydrogens and we'll call this hexane draw this with me notice its boiling point hexane is 69 degrees approximately we're increasing boiling point as the molecules begin to increase in length heptane C7 H16 seven carbons in a row long hydrocarbon chains one two three four five six seven we know to add on those hydrogens we've made a molecule known as heptane hear that P in there and make an observation with me about its boiling point it's about 98 degrees Celsius I went this far for a reason here's one that we're probably familiar with by name it's octane C8H, see 16 and 2 is 18. H carbons in a row. Octane is its name. Now, where does that sound familiar? Octane? Well, hopefully, you see that on your gasoline tanks when you go to fill the gas station it's the major component of gasoline and now we have other additives such as ethanol about 10 percent gasoline these days is ethanol but this is the major component octane is found in gasoline it's a, a mixture of many things but this is a major component octane has a boiling point of about 125 degrees Celsius nine would have a name of no name I love that no name and if we had a carbon 10 you would hear it called decane here's the trend each time we're adding a carbon to our hydrocarbon chain the boiling point is increasing as the molecules become longer and heavier it takes more energy to get them to boil and we use this physical property to begin to separate out the molecules through the process of petroleum distillation. Here's a practice sampling question. With those hydrocarbons that we just drew together and kind of just studied what they looked like, this is what a straight chain hydrocarbon would look like. All of the carbons are in a straight chain. All we're being asked to do is to complete the structure and to do that we know that each hydrogen has to have an octet so I'm just going to draw in on my sapling the single bonds representing the attachments to each of the hydrogen atoms so the first has to have three hydrogens because it's a terminal carbon I have to have four total bonds. The second carbon has to have two hydrogens attached. Left and right are carbons, up and down are hydrogens, so four bonds. Same is true for the third positioned carbon. Left and right are single bonds to carbon, so up and down must be hydrogens. And here's the terminal end of the chain, so it would require three carbons one two three four this molecule we just named a moment ago as butane Do you recognize that straight chain four carbon butane here we have something known as a branched chain in chemistry 
this branch chain means that we have carbons coming off of the main carbon backbone. So we have one going up, one going down. So that's okay. Every carbon needs to have four bonds. So for example, if one carbon here at the upper position is attached to a carbon, it has positions for three single bonds. This carbon here is attached to three other carbons, leaving one space open for the hydrogen. This looks like it has three spaces open. The interior carbons would have two spaces, and at the terminal end, we need three spaces. And then I must also go back and actually add the hydrogen one at a time. You're going to click that H onto your sapling just to show how many hydrogens it took to actually satisfy all four bonds for the carbons. This is probably faster in your sapling because you just click the element on there where I have to write it on. But I want to give you that visual so you can see when you're done drawing yours in sapling it needs to match mine. Here we had a straight chain adding hydrogens to all the carbons to make sure they have four bonds. And even in a branch chain, it's the same game. Every carbon has to have four bonds. Anything missing must be the hydrogen. Well, let's look at an oil refinery. How gasoline and other hydrocarbons are produced from petroleum. And I know that I've given you not only a supplemental video lesson in the early start to kind of talk about this. Um, we'll talk about it in this lesson as well. But This looks like a good old oil refinery, the backbone of the oil industry. So how are gasoline and other hydrocarbons produced from petroleum? Remember this petroleum has thousands of ingredient molecules in there. And this process takes place at this oil refinery. We know this by looking at, I mean this is a very iconic look at uh, the oil industry. We take something called crude oil and separate it into fractions, including the gasoline fraction. So if I look at these long skinny towers here in the petroleum oil refinery industry, they're known as the distillation tower. And what they do is, is kind of talk through what we looked at based on boiling points. We can separate out the different fractions in petroleum based on the number of carbons and their boiling points and they kind of separate them out from there. So we, we have this initial step where crude oil is delivered into a boiler. As the temperature of the boiler increases, notice this flame down here, so the crude oil is separated into fractions but it all arrives into this boiler. As the boiler increases in temperature, compounds with the lowest boiling points begin to vaporize. Now remember the lowest boiling points are the lightest molecule, so the lightest fraction has the lowest boiling point. They're going to come out as vapors, which is gases, aren't they? Things like our methane, CH4, things like our ethane, C2H6, and things like our propane, oops, that's supposed to be a C, so C3H8. These are the lightest gases, and they come off first up there, don't they? At the lightest gases with the lower boiling points, they begin to vaporize. As the temperature increases even more, the boiling points begin to reach those of the heavier molecules and as the heavier molecules begin to rise you start to get things like gasoline coming out down here. Gasoline, you remember the major component is octane, C8, H16 plus 2 is 18. Even heavier in this range, C12 to 16, this is where jet fuel is, is uh, distilled into. 14 to 16 in the, in the length of the carbon chain is our fuel called diesel. Down here, the reformer is actually connected to our cracker, and we'll actually talk a little bit about what a cracker does. What it does is crack the molecule into smaller pieces. So for instance, if we have these larger molecules coming out, let's say uh, C15 to 18, let's say you get a C16H32 and 2 is 34, 
let's say you get something coming out here, what the cracker will do is actually separate it. So if I crack that molecule, I could get C8, and I would get hydrogens, you know, two molecules of C8. Um, this is 34, so cut that in half, you'd get 16, and then the other one would have 18. Notice it has to still add to the 34 total we started. So one of them will just be doubled, the other would be doubled plus 2. This would be an ENE -E just because it contains a double bond in the carbon. But the idea here is, is you know, in, in just thinking about cracking, taking this long molecule and cracking it in this component and letting it rise to be gasoline. The cracker takes long hydrocarbon chains and cuts them or cracks them in half. It doesn't necessarily have to be in half, but it cuts them into shorter molecules. I might have had, uh, you know, instead of 16 being broken even, 8 and 8, I might have had a 10 and 6, a 9 and 5, and so forth. 9 and 5, is that 9 and 7? So we're getting an idea here. The very heavy, heavy molecules like asphalt, the heaviest com uh, component of petroleum, comes out the very lowest part of the distillation. It would take an enormous amount of energy to get this to boil. It doesn't travel up this tube. It comes straight out in this sludge-like asphalt. So for instance, a sapling question might do the following. Rank the following based on boiling point. You have pentane, propane, and hexane. Pentane, we have to become familiar with five carbons. Propane has three carbons. Hexane with its six carbons. The lightest molecule has the lowest boiling point. The heaviest molecule has the highest boiling point. So if we go from highest boiling point, we would label that the hexane. Pentane would be right smack in the middle, wouldn't it? With its five carbons. And the lowest boiling point would be the lightest molecule called propane. And you can see where they would come out. Up here, the lightest molecules come out. They have the lowest boiling point. It takes the least amount of energy to get the lightest molecules to come up this tube. It takes an incredible amount of energy to get the heavy molecules to move through this tube. So here we have an idea of a sapling question as well. This is that same diagram we were just looking at, isn't it? It's representing the distillation of petroleum. The diagram represents a fractional distillation tube. The crude oil, remember the crude oil um, arrives in this furnace and the furnace begins to add heat energy and all the different molecules will separate from each other based on the amount of heat energy they absorb. Which component has the highest boiling point? The highest boiling point, and often trips up beginning students, is not the highest point in the distillation tube, is it? The highest boiling point takes the most energy. What you're looking at is saying, who's the heaviest molecule? Because the heaviest molecule comes out way down here. The highest boiling point is the heaviest molecule. Do you remember what we labeled that as? It was asphalt, wasn't it? Whoops, wrong slide. There it is, We asphalt right there. Which component is found in location A? Well, up here in location A, in our diagram we looked at from our text, those are the lightest gases, aren't they? The lightest would be methane, ethane, propane. These are what we refer to as refinery gases. So A, we know to put that as carbon 1 through 4 gases. In the location C, we had designated as that heaviest, known as asphalt. So just a simple matching. Yours might ask you for different things, but we're getting an idea of where to find things in that fractional distillation tube. So how do we use each barrel of petroleum? A barrel, if you ever hear that reported, is 42 gallons of petroleum. And if this represents the composition uh, and how a barrel of petroleum is generally used, you can see that 19.2 gallons turn into gasoline. 
About 10 gallons turn into diesel and home heating oil. 3.8 gallons turn into jet fuel. Heavy fuel oil, 1.7 gas liquid refinery gas about 1.7 and other products and uh, petroleum is also a major component when we start creating plastics which is one of our chapters as well but 87 percent by far is used for transportation and for heating so transportation and for heating the vast majority of this barrel of oil is used for that When we begin considering energy changes, we're kind of getting into our next section here. How much energy is actually released through the process of combustion? We know that hydrocarbon fuels like methane, which we call natural gas, and the presence of oxygen undergoes combustion. Combustion takes a hydrocarbon, adds oxygen, and forms carbon dioxide and energy. When specifically, we know this to be heat energy. And we know heat energy is measured in a unit called joules or calories. Sometimes we measure it in kilojoules if a, a large amount of energy is produced. So kilo, of course, is a thousand. When energy is released, it's known as an exothermic reaction. Energy released is exo, leaving, exiting, exiting the system to the surroundings. When you feel heat being released, it's hot to our touch because we're in the surroundings feeling the heat. An exothermic releases heat, so the system, or the chemistry here, loses heat energy. It's actually designated with a negative sign when we write out its delta H. So the combustion of methane, for instance, releases 50.1 kilojoules for every gram that's burned or 802.3 kilojoules per mole of methane burn. Oftentimes you'd see this as delta H, the heat of reaction. And for an exothermic, we're saying it's releasing heat. So this is of lower energy. The negative sign shows that. So you're going to see that written as negative 802.3 kJs, which is kilojoules, per mole. Let's take this thermochemical equation. Notice how I put the word thermo. It's a balanced chemical equation that includes heat content. A thermochemical equation. I'm going to represent that on what's called a heat diagram. The term enthalpy is a thermodynamic quantity. In chemistry, it just means heat, a heat diagram. So let's just take a little x, y axis, and I'm just going to say on the y axis, let's just put that label as heat content. And heat is measured in a unit called kilojoules. For an exothermic process, the reactants versus the products. The reactants are on the left side of the arrow, and reactants point at products. Our reactants are of higher energy content, CH4 and the two moles of the molecular oxygen, when burned, notice I'm still pointing at my products. I'm just going to point the arrow down. When they form their carbon dioxide and water, all I've done is kind of shown on an enthalpy diagram the heat content of the reactants versus the products. As this reaction proceeds, it's liberating or generating or releasing 802.3 kilojoules of heat energy for every mole that is burned. An exothermic diagram releases heat energy. Exothermic diagram releases heat where reactants release heat down to the products giving off energy. How we measure this is typically with an instrument known as a bomb calorimeter. And it's just mentioned in our text where we get the information of how much heat content per fuel. We burn it in a bomb calorimeter. So we place the fuel inside of this container that's surrounded with water. And when we ignite it, and that's just a little electrical switch up here, when you give it a little spark of energy, it will ignite 
and the combustion that occurs inside of this container is going to warm up the water. And really what we can detect is how warm the water, you know, here's just a little stir, how much the temperature changes of the water gives us insight into how much energy was released by this particular fuel. So this is all done in a laboratory setting. We take a sample of fuel and ignite it and measure how it affects the temperature of the water. So different fuels have different heat content. When we look at this diagram, and this is something we just drew a moment ago together, we said that the energy of the reactants, this is our natural gas known as methane, when it combusts, it releases heat. The heat is gone to the system, and that's why it's hot to our touch, because we're outside detecting the heat coming out of the chemical reaction. Therefore, notice the sign on our reaction is negative. We have a negative delta H. The delta H is the heat of the reaction. For exothermic, it is negative, telling us that the system which is our chemistry, this reaction, gave off heat to the surroundings where we are. We turned our balanced chemical equation into a thermochemical equation by just sharing that delta energy. The heat of our reaction is delta H for heat. And notice we mentioned this as well. Not all fuels are created equal. I can see methane, which is called natural gas, for every mole of methane that we combust, we get out about 50.1 kilojoules per gram. Notice that's a very high energy content. Octane, which is in gasoline, when we burn one mole of octane, it's giving us about 44.4 joules, joules per gram of energy. Look at where coal is, a little bit less, about 32.8 kilojoules per gram. Ethanol, which is grain alcohol, C2H5OH, this is our additive recently to octane. It's giving us a little bit, not as efficient as octane, is it? It's not as efficient in giving us the same amount of energy. But here, when we were just heating our homes with wood, it took a lot of wood to, to heat our home because there's not a lot of heat energy stored in that particular molecule. So no, not all molecules are created equal for fuel content. Different fuels release different amounts of energy. Let's compare that exothermic reaction to the opposite process called an endothermic. Endothermic is heat absorbing. Like think of a chemical cold pack. Have you ever had an injury and had to put a cold pack? There's a little clip in there. You activate the reaction and it actually gets colder to our touch. So when we have an endothermic reaction, if this is our container, we're out here, heat is going into the system from the surroundings. So of course it's colder out here because the system is absorbing the heat. And if you think about just an enthalpy diagram here, and this is our little heat content, endothermic says as the reactants form products, and I'm just going to use those generic letters, is that right? Whatever our reactants are, they always point at the products. Our heat of reaction is climbing the energy axes, so it will be reported as a positive value in kilojoules. Endothermic absorbs heat energy, positive heat of reaction. Exothermic was the opposite. Exo climbed down the energy, releasing heat warm to our touch, negative delta H on our axes. Let's take a peek at some sampling questions with how this would relate. We're asked to write a balanced equation for the complete combustion of ethane. Now this is a fuel, it's a hydrocarbon. We remember the combustion pattern says take your fuel, C2H6, which we know, we just drew a moment ago, just thinking about what ethane is. We know it had two carbons attached to each other and the six hydrogens 
attached around. C3, C3 bonded together. When it combusts, any fuel that combusts requires oxygen, so we add oxygen. The process of combustion generates our global warming gases, carbon dioxide and water. This is what we refer to as our skeleton. It's not yet balanced, so our skeleton equation has the reactants forming products. It's just not yet balanced. And remember a good strategy when we're a beginning balancing student. We're going to have left and right of our arrow, and I want to track C's, then H's, then O's. Right now on the left side, I count two carbons, I count six hydrogens, and I count two oxygens. Over here, I have one carbon, two H's, and a total of two plus one more is three O's. For no particular reason, I just like to start at the top. Let's start with carbon. Two on the left, one on the right. To balance that, I'm going to place a two on the product side to double the number of carbon. But let's repair the T-chart. Because not only did I change the number of carbon, I also changed the oxygen. There's two times two, which is four, plus one more in the water. I've now gotten that up to five. C's are good. Let's go to the H's. There's six on the left and only two on the right. I can place a three in front of the water. And when I do so, let's repair the T-chart. Three times two has repaired the H's, but it's also changed the oxygens. Two times two is four, plus three more. Four plus three is seven. So here we have a situation. We have two carbons, good, six H's, uh-huh, and the O's are upset. I have two on the left and an odd number on the right. When this happens, my friends, this is the best trick. Everything you just figured out, I mean, unless I want to write a fraction, which I'm not allowed, I can put seven halves there. Seven halves, seven over two times two is seven. That's going to balance it, but I'm not really allowed to put a fraction there. I want us to just double everything we figured out so far. Instead of a three, let's put a six. Instead of a four, let's instead of a two, double it to a four. Instead of the one, make it a two. Because now what's happened, we've doubled all of the numbers. Everything is still balanced, but now look at the scenario. Instead of seven O's on the right, we have four times two is eight, plus six, that gave us 14. By doubling it, I can put a whole number in there and balance the equation. So the ratio that balances is two to seven, four to six. Two to seven, four to six, created an equal number of atoms on both sides of the arrow. I wanted to model that one because it was a little tricky with that odd even number problem. Here's another sapling question. It says ethanol, which is a biofuel, ethanol comes from corn. When ethanol is burned, it releases by the way, releasing is another way of saying it's exothermic. It's being given off, warm to our touch. 1240 kJs of energy. Write the balance chemical equation, including the heat content, delta H. So here's our strategy. We have C2H5OH. To combust it means to add oxygen and form carbon dioxide and water. The delta H part, the heat of reaction, can be added on at the end 
And we know that it's negative because it's releasing heat. So I have to show that I know it's exothermic by using this negative sign. And I'm just going to put 1240 kJs of heat energy. So this is what I refer to as my skeleton. It's not yet balanced, but I have in place all of the bones, don't I? I have all the reactants making the products. I've added on the heat energy. I included that delta H information showing I know it's exothermic because it's releasing heat. Negative value because remember our enthalpy diagram? The reactants would point down at the products releasing that heat content between those chemical bonds. All we have left to do is balance it. So again, as a beginning chemistry student, I like a little t-chart, C's, then H's, then O's. Let's just kind of dive in and see how we do. On the left, I count two carbons. So well, I guess I'll begin with a two right here, balance the carbons. I see a total of six combined hydrogens. So I'm going to put a three here, see where it gets me for a total of six combined hydrogens. C's are good, H's are good. Let's see what the O's are doing. Two times two is four, plus three more on the water. Give me a total of seven oxygens. Three plus four is seven. Now what's nice is that there's one already here in the molecule itself. So if I take out the oxygen from the fuel, that leaves me a total of six more that I need. I can get that by placing a three in front of this oxygen. Three times two is six, plus the one that was already in the fuel for a total of seven that we needed to balance the equation. The ratio of one to three to two to three balanced our thermochemical equation. This is known as the combustion of ethanol which is corn grain. Let's see what else sapling has you doing. A third problem from sapling. I kind of just put them all on one slide. Consider the following thermochemical equation. Thermochemical equation means I know about the heat reaction. I notice that it's negative. It's telling me that it's exothermic. Heat is being released from the system. I have two H2s, and I really should have typed that with subscripts, plus a molecule of oxygen forming two water molecules. So what I know, a two to one to two is my ratio that balanced the equation. How much heat is transferred when 1.8 mole of hydrogen reacts, and will it be absorbed or released. Remember these are key words. Absorbed means endo, getting cold to our touch. Released means exo, getting hot to our touch. Because it's negative, we know it's exo, we know that it's being released. So I know that one right off the bat. By looking at the sign on the delta H, I know it's negative, so heat is being released. But here's what I know from my reaction. See this balanced equation? For every two moles of hydrogen, 484 kJs of heat is released. This is going to be my ratio that I'm going to use to convert down here. So let's start by writing our number that's given, 1.8. The unit that's given is the unit mole and of what is that of hydrogen? I always just like to write my number, unit, and label of what's given. I want to set up a conversion factor, and I always think about what do you want over what you're given. I want to know the kilojoules of heat, right? How much heat? That's a kilojoule of heat. And my given quantity is from the mole. This comes from the balanced equation. This conversion factor is just grabbing what you know from the balanced equation. The kilojoules of heat were negative 
484 from our balanced thermochemical equation when two moles of water were used, I'm sorry, two moles of hydrogen were used. So by creating this conversion, we've canceled moles of hydrogen and are going to be left with kilojoules of heat. We were given 1.8 moles of hydrogen. We wanted to know the kilojoules of heat. When we move from left to right, we set up a conversion that cancels from our balanced equation. We're just pulling what we know from the actual equation. From the balanced equation, we saw our kilojoules over 2. Let's, what is that? 484 over 2. Where's my calculator? 484 divided by 2 times 1.8 and it will be negative because it's a negative exothermic value. So 435.6 kilojoules of heat released exothermic due to that negative sign. It's actually warm to our touch. I'll let you process this lesson so far. When ready, come on back for lesson three and we'll wrap up our chapter together. Good work today, gang.